Saturday, June 30, 1970. Those of you who are in the trade will understand the term. A layman such as myself, I might explain that vent haven, contraction of the word ventriloquism, the word vent, seems to be a common expression of ventriloquists used in referring to themselves, and of course haven, self-explanatory. Vent haven is more of an event than it is a place. It is the idea and work of one man, W.S. Berger. A little bit later in the program, you will be hearing something about W.S. Berger, about the purposes and hopes of Ben Hayden. This time, we would like to invite all of you to see the concrete realization of Mr. Berger's dreams and his hopes. We would like to extend an invitation to each and every one of you to participate in the future in the continual realization of those ideals. In order to expedite the program, I know that you're anxious to see some of the special guests that we have today. We're going to try to move as rapidly as possible and dispose of some of the duties that we must undertake here at the beginning. So there are a number of people that we'd like to introduce to you who are responsible for today and for the continuing work of Ben Haven. I'm going to call upon them to stand and be recognized, but I'd like to ask you in order to save time to save your applause until all have been introduced to you, and then we can recognize them and we'll go on with the program. So first of all, we do have several dignitaries with us today two of whom you will be introduced to you later, so I'm going to pass over them. But I know that uh, Representative Carl Mershon is somewhere in the audience. Carl, would you stand up and wave? Are there any of the other representatives present? All right. Then I would like to introduce to you the Board of Advisors to Van Haven. First of all, one gentleman who could not be with us today from Hopkinsville, Colonel Will William Bowling. He was unable to be with us because he's performing in, I believe, three different acts in another section of the state. Uh, next slide, I'm going to ask you to stand as you're recognized and remain standing until the end. I'd like to uh, introduce to you Mr. Ray Will and his wife, Sandy, and their children. Then Mr. Walter Berlin is on the board, his brother Greg, who came with him today. Two other members of the board, George and Glenn McElroy. Gentlemen, would you stand up, please? McElroy brothers, over there, all right? Uh, the, I might mention that Ray is from Bellevue in the state of Washington, but uh, Mr. Berlin is also from Seattle, Washington. The, Glenn, uh, the McElroy brothers are from Harrison, Ohio. Another member of the board, Mr. Uh, Dennis Allwood, who is from Hollywood and is vice president of ABC. Where are you, Dennis? There you are. Producer director. Producer director. Gratuitous promotion. Finally, there are two gentlemen who are going to perform for you today who are on the board. We're going to pass over them so that we can give you a special introduction to them later in the program. And the final member of the board and someone I would like particularly to introduce to you, Mr. John Arbias. John has done almost all of the arrangement and work that you will see in the museum buildings. He's been with us for the last week, so we particularly want to thank him. Now I'd like you to meet the Board of Trustees of the Haven Museum. First of all, Charles Sutherland and his wife. Charlie, where are you? Very good. And Charlie Palmer and Ethel Palmer. Ray Evans, First National. And his wife, Vivian, wherever you are, Vivian. And finally, a person you might say is the foster father of Ben Haven, who, in the absence of Mr. Berger, was the man who put the trust together and has been its chief driving force ever since, John R. S. Brooking and his wife, Charlotte. So those are the people we'd like you to meet. There are a few uh, persons that we were invited who were unable to attend who expressed their regret, and I'd like to convey to you several messages. First of all, this is addressed to the Ben Haven Trust. I regret a previous commitment will prohibit me from attending the opening of the Van Haven Museum in Fort Mitchell this Saturday. I am sure this collection of ventriloquist memorabilia will give many hours of pleasure to home folks and visitors alike. 
please express my best wishes to everyone connected with the museum and to those attending the opening ceremonies. The Honorable Wendell H. Ford, Governor of the Commonwealth of Kentucky. We also have a letter from a gentleman I'm sure many of you will recognize. This is addressed to Mr. Brooking as the Chief Trustee. With keen regret, I write to say that I will not be able to be with you on the 30th to celebrate the opening of Ben Haven. I'm sending a copy of your letter to Paul Winchell and Bob Neller. Neller used to work for me and he wrote me a few days ago as how he could reach Winchell as Bob has a McElroy figure to see. The enclosed card shows my three figures. I have loaned the little girl to a boy out here, but I'll never part with the little Negro. Happy day on the 30th, signed by Rudy Ballard. And finally, this is sent to Charlie McCarthy and care of Ben Haven. It says, Dear Charlie, please give regards to all those, all the residents at Ben Haven. I will move in too when I retire. Love, Lamb Chops, friend of Sherry Lewis. Now, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to move on to the substance of the program. First of all, we'd like to have you learn a little something about Ben Haven and about its founding. For that purpose, I'm going to call on my wife, Susan DeFelize, to tell us something about Ben Haven. The history of Ben Haven is really the story of its founder, William Shakespeare Berger or as he was known to his close friends and associates, W.S. Mr. Burger was born on May 13, 1878, in Cincinnati. His father, Giza Berger, was a German Shakespearean actor and also a playwright, author, and journalist. W.S. Berger's interest in the theater, and specifically ventriloquism, came from his actor father, who entertained his small son by making hand puppets out of colored handkerchiefs and grease paint. As a lad of five or six, Mr. Berger was wild about snakes, having ambitions of becoming a big name snake charmer. By the age of 14, he had several trunks full of reptiles, living and dead, that he used to entertain his friends. Mr. Berger first became really interested in ventriloquism when he was 15. He read every book he could find on the subject, and he practiced until he had mastered the art of voice throwing himself. Although he was earning only $3 a week, at the time, he never missed a chance to see any vet who was performing in the area. For the next 40 years, Mr. Berger, though never losing his interest in ventriloquism, was preoccupied with business. In 1895, while still in his teens, he started work as an office boy for Cambridge Tile Company in Cincinnati. He rose to its presidency in 1941 and served as president until his retirement in 1947 when he became chairman of the board. Mr. Berger was also active with the Covington Trust and Banking Company, becoming a director in 1926. While on a business trip to New York in 1910, Mr. Berger bought his first figure, Tommy Baloney. Tommy was put away for many years while Mr. Berger was involved with his career. In 1930, Tommy was resurrected for a Christmas party. This figure was soon joined by other figures, including Skinny, Mr. Berger's favorite. Skinny and his master never performed professionally, but Skinny did his share to help at sales meetings, employee parties, and other functions at Cambridge Tile. It was at this time, especially after his 1947 retirement, that Mr. Berger began his collection of ventriloquist figures and memorabilia, which today comprise Vent Haven Museum. As the years passed, the collection grew with Mr. Berger's enthusiasm, concern, and devotion. Anything he thought pertained to the collection he tried to obtain, and the acquisitions came in from all over the world. First, they were housed in the Berger home, but were eventually moved to the garage, which was expanded, then to a second building, the Josephine Berger Memorial Building, and recently to a third, the W.S. Berger Memorial Building. Many of the figures were purchased, others donated, and still others willed by Vince, convinced their friends could find no better home. Also around the time, time of his retirement, Mr. Berger became president of the IBV, the International Brotherhood of Ventriloquists. Under his guidance, the IBV flourished and grew. It went from 300 members to over 1,000 members throughout the world. Much of this success was due to the extensive personal correspondence that Mr. Berger conducted with other vets, 
sometimes as many as 500 letters a month. It was also due to the Oracle, the official publication of the IBV, which Mr. Berger founded. Mr. Berger wrote a column for the Oracle called Flashes, which some of you might remember, which he continued in the Ventogram when the Oracle stopped publishing. In 1960, Mr. Berger retired from the IBV, and since there was no one to take the role he played, the organization folded in the early 60s. Vent Haven today is the largest known collection of ventriloquial material in the world. Besides the approximately 500 ventriloquist figures in the museum, there are hundreds of volumes on ventriloquism in the library, books in eight languages dating back to the early 18th century, late 18th century, excuse me. The library also contains ventriloquism courses, sheet music, scripts, pamphlets, playbills, records, tape recordings, and even films certainly the largest collection of printed material devoted to ventriloquism. The museum also contains countless novelty items and memorabilia, talking canes, hand-carved miniature figures, drinking glasses and other props used in the acts, and even a grandfather's clock that turns into a figure. There are cabinets of costumes and a rogues gallery of hundreds of autographs, pictures, and events from around the world. Due to the planning and foresightedness of W.S. Berger, Ben Haven Museum will remain as a permanent institution, open to the public and devoted to the art of ventriloquism. Thank you. Discipline at the school. Introduced to you as a member of the Board of Advisors. He's one of the two we passed over earlier. If you've been a television fan as long as I have, you'll immediately recognize him. He's been a television star for many years. You've also been a faithful drinker, drinker of Nestle's chocolate, which I have been. You will immediately recognize his dog. I'd like you to meet and greet Mr. Jimmy Nelson, his friend Danny O'Day, and his dog Farkle. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's nice, thank you. That was that was a real nice introduction. We we have a, a group of uh, dignitaries out here. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. Look look at all the people sitting in the sun. Yes, yeah, hot, isn't it? <laughs> Timber! Get up here. I thought you might like to know which is which up here. This this is Danny O'Day. This idiot is Jimmy Nelson. Thank you. One is a ventriculist, one is a dummy. Are there any questions? <laughs> they all know which one is a dummy. You want to bet? Look, you be careful. You be careful. Do you realize in this neighborhood, dummies outnumber the people? I think you're right. Yeah. One word from me and we march on Fort Mitchell. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Yeah, yeah. yeah. At any rate, it's, it's, a, it's a real pleasure to be here because uh, I can say that I had the pleasure of knowing Mr. Berger for many years and we have visited here many times in his home and have seen this collection grow from something up in his attic to three beautiful buildings in the rear. Yeah. And if you haven't seen the collection, you must see it. Yeah. It really... Get your hands off the suit. <laughs> it really... Get your little hands I'm... off the little dummy's wardrobe. <laughs> I, As they say at Watergate, don't bug me. <laughs> Look. Put the hand in the pocket. I don't feel like it. In the pocket. <laughs> That'll show you who's a star of this act. <laughs> you know, I look out here and I see so many people. I see some young people with the little Daniel Day dolls, Jerry Mahoney, some Charlie McCarthy dolls. I see this one over here. What happened to his head? Hold that little fellow up. He looks in bad shape there. Yeah. 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 <laughs> well, that's okay. It's Jerry Mahoney. Hit him again. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we have some others. Yeah. Hold hold them up. I, I see a half a dozen of them. Are there. There's a fellow over there. What, what is that? Is that a Charlie? Charlie McCarthy. He's all right. He's all right. Yeah. <laughs> we have to say that, Mr. Bergen is here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I thought that maybe just for a few minutes, you might like to, uh, to have you... <laughs> What are you doing? It's it on your neck. It's a freckle. It's moving. Oh, come on. No, we, don't. we don't do those jokes anymore. Do you mind if I start the whole thing over again? What are you going to do? I'm going to comb the hair. Yours? No, yours. It's it. All right. Yeah. Yes. Do 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 Get the other side. Which other side? This one right here. Okay. <laughs> okay, you look very nice. Now, now turn around. What are you looking at? The people in the back. What about it? They can see your hand in my back. 
cold icy fingers. Would you try to Not that hangnail. Will you leave me alone? Please? Yeah. Look, since we do have a nice gathering here, and it's our job just to kind of lighten things up, what are you doing now? Your circle has a friend. Will you leave me alone? I love those old routines. What I had in mind was just, you know, being a dedication here today and uh, being a friend, I can happily say, Mr. Berger. Uh, not only do, uh, am I delighted that this Ben Haven Museum is going to go on in perpetuity, but I was hoping that maybe a lot of young people would come and visit. And we see that we have some here today. Yeah. We have a young man in the audience, and I'd like to call him up right now. Uh, David Razor, are you out there? Where's David? Yell Bingo. Would you come up here, please, for a minute? Yeah. Here's a young man just starting out in the field of ventriloquism. And I think this is what Mr. Berger had in mind, collecting all of these dummies, we call them. Actually, they're called figures. And to give young people a chance. I was about 16 years old when I first met Mr. Berger, and he encouraged me in the art of ventriloquism. Big round of applause here for Mr. David Ray. David, I, uh, I I'm right, right, David? Ready? Okay. <laughs> what, what do you call your friend? Uh, Charlie. I figured. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> David, would you do? Would you uh, do a little something with Charlie for us? <laughs> well, I don't know. Just uh, give us a little demonstration of how you uh, how you work. Go ahead. Oh, well, this is a real nice audience. Real nice, actually. Yeah, it is. Uh, I'm trying to get this quite a bit of Charlie McCarthy's out uh, here. Yes, there is. I got that Edward Who? Edward. Oh, yeah, he's out here somewhere. Yeah, where is he? He's in the suitcase. <laughs> <laughs> David, how old are you? Uh, 14. 14. How long have you been doing ventriloquism? Uh, four years. About four years. You intend to make it to your uh, hobby, or do you like no. to make a life work out of it? No. No? Just a hobby. Just a hobby. Well, lots of good luck to you, David. We appreciate you coming up here. Have a good night and visited the, with Mr. Berger. You know, ventriloquism today is something you don't see as much as you saw it in the old days. You used to see a lot of ventriloquists on the Ed Sullivan Show. Ed Sullivan Show is not with us anymore. Occasionally, it will pop up on Mike Douglas and Merv Griffin, and that's about it. Yeah. But ventriloquism is certainly as alive as I can remember it, because as I travel around the country and entertain at banquets and state fairs and county fairs, audiences are still very, very responsive. So believe me, ventriloquism is alive and well and mainly living in Fort Mitchell, Kentucky. Yeah. Yes, sir. Danny, do me a big favor. Yeah. Yeah. Do me a favor and and and, and do something for me. Like uh, ventriloquism. No, no, no. Like, uh, ventriloquism. Yeah. You be the ventriloquist and I'll wait for you in the trunk. No, no, no. No, no. no not ventriloquist. No. no. The word is ventriloquist. Ventriloquist. No. Then chop off. No. Then cheesy. No. Papaya juice. No. Cha cha cha. No. no. <laughs> For the benefit of the youngsters in the crowd, repeat after me. I want to teach you the word. Repeat after me. Ben, ventriloquist. 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 No. <laughs> Once more for the people under the shade tree over there. They're the most comfortable ones. Once again, Ben, ventriloquist. Ventriloquist. How come you can say it and I can't? <laughs> now that's the whole idea of the thing. I think you got the idea. Talking without moving the lips. When are you going to start? <laughs> My little sloppy today. Just. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll ask somebody in the crowd to give me a difficult word, all right? Something very hard, and then I'll try and say it without moving the lips. Good. Yeah. yeah. Anybody have a hard word? Just shout it out. Transportation. All right. Wait until that plane goes over. Yeah, yeah. Good heavens, it's Arthur Godfrey. It must be. <laughs> Transportation. Yeah, yeah. You hold the mouth like this, and you go with... Uh, that's very hard. That's got the P in the middle. Say it. Just a minute. Say it. Say it. Just a minute. Am I moving the lips? Not at all. Thank you. The teeth are going like crazy. It's embarrassing. <laughs> Say transportation. What? Say transportation. Cha, cha, cha. I can't do that one. Somebody give me another word. Anything at all. Anybody have a word? Mississippi. Mississippi. State or river? <laughs> it doesn't matter. You hold the lips like this and you go... This? <laughs> How am I doing so far? The breeze from your mouth could cool Fort Mitchell for a month. Are you kidding? Say Mississippi! What? Come on! Say Mississippi is a form of transportation. Can you say that? No. No. Say Tina Piper picked a pick on Mississippi. Let's forget it. Yeah. These are phrases and words that I can't do. He can do... Yes, ma'am. Yes, sir. I can't tell you. <laughs> Encyclopedia? All right. Britannica? Doesn't matter. Yeah. yeah. 
Say it. What? Come on, say encyclopedia. I can't. Say encyclopedia. Encyclopedia! <laughs> Look, before I put you down. Yeah. Oh, my nice. Three! Isn't that nice when people applaud? They're not applauding. What were they doing? Slapping their faces to keep awake. <laughs> Very likely, but before I put you down. What'd you say? I said before I put you down. Don't you always? <laughs> I thought maybe some of the folks, just for a minute, because we have more on the program, we don't want to... I thought you might like to say hello to our mascot, Farfel, would you? Let, Danny, I'm going to set you down here. Yeah. Uh, Ray, is Farfel over there? Would you bring him up here for me? What is it? This is Farfel. He's a dog, and he's been with us a long time. Sit, sit over here. Don't, don't say anything. There you are. Don't say over here. Here we go. Thank you, Ray. That's that's real good. We'll we'll set him right over here on the other knee. There we are. Into the microphone, Farfel. This is Farfel, and he's a rather ugly-looking dog. No, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> Would you? Silly looking animal. It takes one to know one. <laughs> Barbara, do me a favor and wave to all the boys and girls down front. They might wave back. Go ahead. There you go. Everybody wave. You wave a little bit of Barbara. That's good. That's, no, I said wave. Don't scratch. Barbara, don't scratch. Why do you always scratch yourself? I'm the only one who knows where it itches. Yes. <laughs> Look, I didn't bring you out here to make jokes. I thought you might do the one thing, your one, one claim to fame. Farfel did a commercial on television that lasted about 10 years. What would you sing that one more time for us? I'd be delighted. All right. First, ask me what kind of dog I am. I got an old gag, it'll get a scream. <laughs> well, we could all use a good laugh. <laughs> what kind of dog are you? Are you ready? Mm -hmm. I'm a Mexican Spitz. <laughs> I think I know what's coming. <laughs> There's no such thing as a Mexican Spitz. Senor. Yeah. Oh, come on. <laughs> the oldies are the goodies, I always maintain. <laughs> Would you just sing the song, please, so that we can get off, as they say in show business, cleanly? All right. Will you give me that A, please? Will somebody sing an A for Farfel? <laughs> Once again. A little louder. Did you get that? <laughs> That's close enough. All right, the commercial like you used to do it on television. Now you're ready. Contact. Roger. Older. Out. Go ahead. No. N-E-L-T-S-E. -E. -E -E it's been a long time. <laughs> no. Go ahead. N-E-S-T-L-E-S. That's it. Nestle makes the very best. Thank you. to us here this afternoon and our duty was just to come up here and kind of uh, liven things up for a little bit yeah but it's a real privilege to be here and to be part of the festivities and we really are very pleased that the people in charge invited us here today right yeah yeah we'll be looking at you from time to time on the tv too but until then this will be jimmy nelson danny o'day i think it's the other way around <laughs> lots of luck to the ben haven museum thank you for coming this afternoon god bless yeah Bye -bye. Also a member of the Board of Advisors. Hopefully, in addition to showing us some of the art of ventriloquism, he will tell us something about the art of ventriloquism, as it was and as it is and as it will be. He's known to millions of Americans. For 20 years, he came into the homes of Americans every Sunday night and entertained over 50 million Americans. His name is synonymous with ventriloquism. Father of Candace Bergen, Edgar Bergen. Where are you? for that nice reception. I guess it means that we've spent evenings together before at your TV set or your radio listening to Charlie McCarthy. You know, for years I was known as the father of Charlie McCarthy. Then lately I became known as the father of Candace Bergen. I just can't seem to make it on my own. 
but I keep trying. And worse than that, she thinks I'm kind of square. She said if I took LSD, I would probably see Lawrence Well. <laughs> At least I would understand this music. But life is very good. It's, it's just great. Well, it's the best thing I've come across, I'll say that. You know. and, but I've, you've got to play it kind of cozy, you know. There's no point in trying to act like a teenager when you're not, you know. No point in going out and trying to paint the town if you're all out of paint. Uh, and by 9.30, your bucket is dragging. So, so I enjoy congenial parties like we have here, meeting nice folks and... Uh, and cocktail party. We had a nice cocktail party last night. Yeah. I like cocktail parties, you know. Everybody talks, nobody listens. You see olives bobbing up and down as you look around the room, you know. It makes a nice picture of mass lubrication, or better living through chemistry, I guess you could call it. I don't want to give the impression that I, I drink very much because I don't. I, I never drink more than I can carry. You know, there have been a few times I should have made two trips, I suppose. But I came up with two rules for drinking, you know, so you won't have that one drink too many that, that embarrasses you and you hate the next morning. One is when you start seeing double and feeling single, you should stop drinking. The other one is when you start knocking things over and your speech gets a little thick and you say, uh, well, I'm certainly glad to be here. And you catch yourself and you say to yourself, I've had too much. So you're going to cover up your condition by being real elegant. So you say, how do you do a good So that's another sign. So just remember that. When you start feeling sophisticated and can't pronounce it, you've had it. <laughs> uh, I got to tell a couple of jokes and then uh, uh, I want to talk a little about that. Uh, I had a cocktail party a year ago, so I met an elderly lady. She, would, she says, I'll have a... I'll have one more double martini, bartender. I says, can you handle a double martini? She says, oh yeah. She says, I'm 78 years old and I like a little nip in the afternoon, you know. I say, I says, well, you're living life to the fullest. She says, oh yes, I was out last night. I had a date with a boy 82. I says, I says, it was it really a date? She says, oh yes. I had to slap his face twice. I says, you know me. You mean he got fresh? She says, no, I thought he was dead. <laughs> oh, well. I think that's enough of that. <laughs> well, I, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to see what we have here. You can certainly boast of having the only thing in the world that we all know of, and, and, and you've got it right here. Are we in Fort Mitchell now, or are we in Covington, or Fort Mitchell? Yeah. I don't know where I am. I'm at the hotel. <laughs> uh, and it, it is, I had no idea until I came here today. I visited uh, Berger's collection here about 10 years ago. And I didn't know there were that many dummies in the world. In this. You may wonder, so what's important? So there's a bunch of dummies there. Well, there are all kinds of hobbies, collecting bottles, collecting old coins, collecting guns, and collecting iron banks for kids and all this sort of thing. And uh, the one thing about, uh, I must say about ventriloquism, it hasn't gone out of style. Ventriloquists haven't all died off. It's just that vaudeville and nightclubs died off. <laughs> and we hope that, that there will be small theaters and clubs coming back where all these young people have a chance, have a chance to try out. And as I said on the interview, a chance to be bad. And to be, that's the public will tell you uh, what you're doing wrong and what goes and what doesn't go and that's very important for young people and there are many young folks today that will never have the thrill of stopping a show because there's no place to do it and, uh, television is a different medium you play to equipment there you know uh, and that is uh, and they tell you when to applaud and when not to applaud and when to laugh and if you don't laugh they'll put a laugh track on <laughs> so it works one way ventriloquism is it's a very old form of art. It goes back 300 years before Christ. It was practiced by the Greeks. There was a Greek philosopher named Eurycles who was a famous ventriloquist. Practiced by the Egyptians and the Chinese. And so it's, it is, it's been around a long time. I, went, I started doing it when I was in the seventh and eighth grade in the little town of Decatur, Michigan. And I had never seen a ventriloquist 
and I certainly was surprised. The first ventriloquist I saw in this little town of 1,100 people in Michigan was the Vernon, and I was certainly amazed to see his figures here in the museum. The, the first ventriloquist I ever saw, and I stayed with it, and I had went out on Chautauqua. I played Kentucky in Chautauqua. I played it in Vaudeville, and uh, uh, it, it was always a lot of fun. You can, you don't do too much harm going around making people laugh. So I, I, I started out. I wanted to be a, a doctor and as a pre-medic, as so, but uh, they talked me out of it. Well, they flunked me out of it. That's what they did. <laughs> It's hard to say how many people are alive today because I became a ventriloquist. <laughs> of course, I had a couple of doctors that almost killed me. <laughs> uh, then I went out on Chautauqua and I was t t telling them my experiences. I played, I, actors like to boast of playing to big crowds, you know, sell out, stand up, standing audience, room only and all that. Well, I played to the world's smallest audience. It was up in Michigan, and there was some trouble with the contract, the people, they were boycotting it. I played to, in this Chautauqua tent, I played to one woman and a dog, and halfway through my act, the dog walked out. <laughs> well, I think you've got the message, not me. I, uh, I think uh, I would like to introduce, if you'd like somebody stupid, I, I brought him along with me today. And uh, I'm speaking of Mortimer Schnurr. And, uh, uh, I just want to say this uh, for the young ventriloquists here. I think it's important, uh, I've maybe made too much of it, but I think it's very important that the doll, the character, the figure that you pick, you should first listen to your voice on a tape or on record and imagine what that person sounds like. And it, then it should be amusing or funny to help you out. And then you make a character to fit the voice. For example, I had Charlie, and I was doing a shapery in Chicago, and I was bringing him on for encores, which wasn't the right thing. You should do something a little different for your encore. So I came up with the voice, this voice. Well, now, he sounds kind of stupid. Well, now, how do you make a likable, stupid face, you see? Well, I was drawing pictures. Character analysis through the features of the face. So Mortimer, he is a lowbrow, that makes him stupid. He has high arched eyebrows, that means he's a dreamer. He doesn't knit his brow in thought. And he has a low bridged nose and it's bulbous, that means he's not aggressive. And he has a weak receding chin, so that means he doesn't have much determination. So you put it all together and you have Mortimer Snurd. He is scientifically stupid and he's just exactly what I want. <laughs> and I'll now bring out Mortimer and stop talking about it. <laughs> Why don't you wink at the pretty girls down there? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm not going to wink at no girls here now. No, sir, boy. I'm not going to do that. Boy. Well, say hello to the people here. Well, I don't know who they are. Well, that's all right. You don't have to know. Uh, smile at the people over there. <laughs> yeah. Now smile at the people up there on the shelf. <laughs> Yeah. And way back there, could you project your personality back there? You, you mean from here? From here, yeah. Oh, I don't think so. No. Well, try it. I can't do it without my truss on. Oh, I see. Uh, I might get a hernia. Yeah, I see. Uh, <laughs> gee, the seat's slippery. Yes, it is. I'm sorry. Yes. Well, now, when you come before a nice audience like this, Mortimer, you should be friendly. Well, you must be friendly. And, and then for the ladies, you should be a little sexy. Oh, <laughs> um, I'm not very sexy. Goodbye, boys. <laughs> so, <laughs> they're walking now down the sea. Yeah, you should be a little sexy. Is that right? Yes, yes. Well, I'm not... Uh, I'm not very sexy. Oh, you're not. No. Good look at me. Yeah. <laughs> you don't have a girl, do you? No, God. No, no, no. How many times have you been kissed? No. <laughs> you mean counting girls? Yeah. Well, <laughs> well what else? Well, um, uh, Grand Grandpa used to kiss me goodnight. Oh, he did? Yeah. yeah. Well, there's no thrill in that. Oh, really? No. no. Uh, well, I guess that's why you quit doing it. I imagine so, yeah. yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, that's the way it goes. Yeah. Is your mother living yet? No, no, not yet, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> not with me, or not with me. You see, I was an unwanted child. Oh, I'm not. How did it happen? Well, it's a long story and a dirty one. I see. <laughs> see, years ago, Ma bet everything she had on uh, Senator Goldwater for president. I see. And uh, he didn't make it. And she paid off. <laughs> and here I am. I see. <laughs> Well, it's the old story. Politics makes strange bedfellows. Yes, I see. Yes, yes to the good. Yeah. What about your father? Well, he was nice to me. He used to take me for long walks in the woods and leave me there. <laughs> Where's your father now? He got lost in the woods. Oh, yeah. He... <laughs> well, you live with Grandpa Snurd on the farm. Yeah, yeah, I see. I like it there, yeah. Always something going on. Yeah. Last week the stork visited the barn. Oh, the stork, yeah. Did your cow calf? No, but my pig, pig. Oh, I see. Yeah. She had 13 babies. Oh, my, she must be a proud mother. Well, she's a little embarrassed. Okay. <laughs> she can only set places for 12, I see. Yeah, well, she must be kept busy. Oh, yeah. It's always crowded around her room. Her uh, uh, snack bar. I yeah. Know she yeah, she wasn't geared for that kind of production. She's either got to hold back or retool. Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Well, that's very interesting. Yes. Are you going to be a farmer when you grow up? No, no, I'm going to be a lifeguard. A lifeguard? Yeah, well, I see. Have you studied life saving? Well, I had it as a voice count. You did? Yeah, yeah. And uh, that was good, yeah. Well, do you know what to do? Well, I can always look it up in the book. Yeah, I know. It's right there. Well, it should be up there. Well, yes. Well, let me just rehearse a little. Suppose you're a lifeguard and this is a beach, you know, and out there is a lake. Is that so? Yes, yes. And over, over there, there's a boy swimming. Well, ain't that nice? Yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden, that boy says, help, help, I'm drowning. Well, now, that's a shame. Yes, it is. <laughs> Well, what do you want to do about it? Who, me? You're the lifeguard. Oh, yeah, yeah. Come to think of it, yeah. Well, let's think it over. Well, you're not supposed to have to think it over. No. What does the book say? Oh, I don't know. I'll have to get it. No, no. How far out is he? Oh, let's say 120 yards. Oh, the hell is that? <laughs> I'm going on a coffee break. No, you're not. No, no. Well, the book says to row out there in a boat. That's what the book says. Well, why don't you do it? Or I will. Yeah. Now, by the time you get out there, that boy's gone under. You can't see him from the surface. <laughs> Wasn't worth the trouble, was it? Either? <laughs> you can't see him, so what do you do? I'll go out in the glass bottle, though. No, no, no. You'll dive in the water. You'll get hold of that boy, get him out of the water, and then get the water out of him. Oh, yeah, yeah. How do you do that? Well, I'll tell you what you do. I remember that. Uh, You'll, uh, you'll hang, get them ashore, see, yeah. and then you hang them over a barrel and let them drain and let them drain. Yeah, yeah. that's all you gotta do. Yeah. Well, there's no barrel on the beach, so then, then there's no barrel there, no. Well, did you look? Yeah. Well, there's one in the boat. There. <laughs> what do you do? There's no barrel. No barrel, huh? Yeah. Well, a Boy Scout is always cheerful, so you just say, ho, 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 ho. <laughs> what the hell, no barrel. <laughs> what are you going to do for that boy? Oh, he did yet? Yeah. <laughs> You're going to give him, uh, what, artificial uh, suffocation? No. Perspiration? No, no, no. This is the dumbest conversation I've ever been mixed up in. Uh, you noticed it too. Yes, I did. Well, you can only blame me for about half of it. Well, uh, how can you be so stupid? Well, I'll tell you, I got a fellow helping me. Oh, I see. Thank you. Goodbye. Press agents for for the museum here, and we're very very proud of it. And you have it in your town, and and we hope to get some interesting stories out and uh, see it grow and. I'm very happy to be here to be a part of it. Thank you again.
to present to you the mayor of Fort Mitchell, the Honorable William Edwards. Mayor. I never had to lower the mic. You like the guy before me, he's always six foot ten. The city of Fort Mitchell is very, very happy and very, very proud today to, first of all, see this wonderful turnout, which I'm sure is very encouraging to the members of the committee and the people that have helped make this possible. Especially would like to thank our honored guests who came from great distances and helped us open this museum. In honor of this occasion, the city of Fort Mitchell have proclaimed this day to be the Ben Heyman Memorial <coughs> Day in the city of Fort Mitchell, Kentucky. I thank you. John, why don't you accept this on behalf of the Board of Trustees? Very modest man. The next gentleman we would like to introduce to you is somewhat unique in that uh, he's one of the few office holders in the country who's both the chief legislator, the chief executive officer, and the chief judicial officer of his political district. And that is the county judge of Kenton County, our own, the Honorable James Dressen. Judge? Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I want to express my personal thanks for the committee inviting me here, and I certainly want to express on your part our thanks to Mr. Bergen and Mr. Nelson for the entertainment that they provided. I'm sure all the children enjoyed it very much. Now, I'm here uh, as a representative of the governor of this state. As you know, it's, uh, Kentucky is noted for being very hospitable to all its guests, and I'm sure that you are uh, as proud as I am that Governor Ford has recognized our two nationally known and distinguished guests. So he has asked me to confer upon these two gentlemen the Honorable Order of Kentucky Colonel. So if uh, Mr. Berger and uh, Mr. Nelson will come up here, I'll present it to them. Well, Mr. Bergen and Mr. Nelson, uh, Governor Wendell Ford, uh, the chief executive of the state of Kentucky, has uh, requested that I present on his behalf his commission to both of you as a Kentucky colonel. And uh, with this goes all the honors and all the rights and privileges that belong to that office. Now, I'll tell you that it won't get you in the Kentucky Derby free. It won't get you in the Kenton County Police Court free. I don't know what it's good for. But anyway, it is a great honor, and you will be hearing from uh, the head of the Kentucky Colonel's uh, organization yearly around Kentucky Derby time and be invited to banquets and barbecues and all kind of honors that they do have Kentucky Derby if you get that way. So it is gives me great honor to present to you on behalf of the governor a commission as Kentucky Colonel Mr. Bergen and also you, Mr. Nelson. It doesn't screw things up too much if I'm already a Kentucky Colonel, does it? Well, no, sir. You can get these things three or four times if you're honorable enough. Uh, I was hoping it was a pardon from the governor for the show I just did. <laughs> it's a really great honor. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. I would like to ask one request to you that please no smoking in the buildings and please do not handle the figures. Many of them are very old and very <laughs> delicate. And we would like to tell you that the museum will be open Memorial Day through Labor Day. You will call. You may take your groups through by appointment. Now, gentlemen, the judge and the mayor, Mr. Nelson, Mr. Bergen, if you'll go back and cut the ribbon, we'd like to open the plate to the crowd. So if you'll all sort of form around the white ribbon in the back, we'll cut it and open the museum officially. 